ill-fated Gang of Six effort. Uh, I got to know Tom's intelligence, integrity, irascible nature, is that the right word? Occasionally pain in the what, whatever. Um, but I, I share with you, um, if you would be missing, I would have joined, joined you in that kind of tribute, but it, you saw how badly I appeared pre- pre- anytime I tried to go here and look. Um, I'm probably doing better tribute, like I say. Mr. Um, <clears throat> Radcliffe, it's great to see you. I know these are normally hearings where we um, you know, close counting. We're supposed to see the, uh, you know, the uh, impression in the whites of your eyes. I- I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make that kind of judgment from, from here with my slightly aging eyes. You, uh, I get the general sense of you, and I can actually see a little smile at that point. Uh, it, it terms the grimaces at times, we'll, uh, uh, we'll know, but it's, it's, it's great to have you here, and I appreciate it. Uh, the opportunity we had last Friday to spend uh, some quality time together. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, as, as uh, Chairman's already noted, I once again must note that these are unprecedented times. America faces a challenge to our lives and security that we've not had in over half a century. And it's during such trying times that we all recognize the value of nonpartisan expertise throughout our government. Nowhere is this clearer than in the apolitical intelligence community. The IC collects intelligence on imminent and potential threats, analyzes them dispassionately, and presents its best estimates without fear or favor to our nation's leaders. This is essential so that policymakers can craft a timely and effective response to protect America. And nowhere is the need for competent, apolitical leadership clearer than in the position of the Director of National Intelligence, who stands at the head of the nation's 17 intelligence agencies. Unfortunately, what we've seen from the President ever since he came into office is an unrelenting and I believe undeserved attack upon our professional women and men of our intelligence agencies. This is not because our intelligence community is deserving of these attacks, nor are they at the heart of some quote unquote deep state conspiracy to undermine our political leaders. No, I believe the president attacks our intelligence agencies for one simple reason because unvarnished truth and unembellished analysis are not welcome in this White House. What we've seen over the last year has been especially dangerous. The systematic firing of anyone at the ODI who has the temerity to speak truth to power. From DNI, Dan Coates, and Principal Deputy DNI, Sue Gordon, the acting DNI Admiral Joe McGuire, the acting director of National Counterterrorism Center, Russ Travers, to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, Michael Atkinson. These firings and forced departures from the leadership of the intelligence community have left the ODNI without a single Senate confirmed leader at the time. Instead, an acting DNI with no experience in intelligence, but with plenty of political loyalty to the president, has it been appointed to oversee America's intelligence enterprise. As acting DNI, this individual promptly is to hiring freeze and reorganization whose purpose has not been communicated to the intelligence oversight committees. He also quickly fired senior leaders with decades of Alarmingly, we have begun to hear reports that intelligence professionals have been inappropriately pressured to limit the information they share with Congress. And now, Mr. Ratcliffe, the President has nominated you to this critical position of national security and intelligence leadership. I have to say that while I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt during this hearing, I don't see what has changed since last summer when the President decided not to proceed with your nomination 
over concerns about your inexperience, partisanship, and past statements that seem to embellish you. This includes some particularly damaging remarks about whistleblowers, which has long been a bipartisan cause on this committee. I'll speak plainly. I still have some of the same doubts now as I had back in August. Some have suggested that your main qualification for confirmation for this post is that you are not Ambassador Grinnell. But frankly, that's not enough. Before he put the Senate's stamp of approval to confirm a nominee to this critical position, Senators must demand the qualities that the Senate specified when it passed the law creating the ODNI at the 9-11 legislation, which my colleagues, like Senator Collins, are proper. You must expect and demand professionalism, a nonpartisan commitment to the truth, and a rock-solid dedication to defending those who defend us every day, the professional women and men of our nation's intelligence group. I hope that today you get a sense of your ability to adhere to that call. I look forward to the question and look forward to this opportunity. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Vice Chairman. Former Attorney General John Kinnisgrove was planning, scheduled for you, to introduce Representative Radcliffe, given the current circumstances, he could not attend. He sent us his remarks, and Senator Coleman has immediately agreed to represent Attorney General Ashcroft today. Senator Coleman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I acknowledge the good view of my colleagues on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and today it's my pleasure to introduce John Radcliffe, who is the nominee for Director of National Intelligence. As the Chairman said, we do have a letter from the former Attorney General, and it's rather lengthy. I'm not going to read all of it, but I will refer to some excerpts, but I'd ask for the benefit of who may be part of the letter to follow up on it. And the reason why I think it's so important for the committee and the Senate to hear from former Attorney General Radcliffe, excuse me, former Attorney General Ashcroft, is because of his intimate knowledge of the professional qualifications of the nominee, as well as the personal qualifications, his intelligence, and his integrity. Let me just start by reading an excerpt from Attorney General Ashcroft's letter. He said, Integrity is the indispensable imperative for intelligence, the best friend of national security. And national security is the singular portfolio most allergic to the infection and devaluation that results from inaccuracy and distortion. For high-quality decision-making, sound intelligence must never be contaminated by personal bias or political predisposition. General Ashcroft goes on to say, I've known and worked with John for more than a decade, and I know of no person, no person, with a higher commitment to integrity. And I've seen him speak the unvarnished truth to those he works with and works for, whether senior government officials or corporate CEOs. He makes an important point, and he did in my conversation with him yesterday at his farm in Missouri. He makes the point that over the last 15 years, Congressman Ratliff has served in crucial roles as both a developer and consumer of intelligence, a role that I think speaks to his background and qualifications for this job. Finally, he said, John Ratliff is committed to forging an intelligence community that delivers in a coordinated manner the most insightful and accurate intelligence and counterintelligence possible. He will serve decision-makers with wholesome, transparent intelligence that enables them to make decisions to defend the nation from threat and to keep our citizens safe and free. Mr. Chairman, I know that coming to this nomination as a member of Congress, that Congressman Ratliff, as any member of Congress might, people wonder, does he really understand the difference between being in the adversarial atmosphere and 
that is Congress, and that especially speaks to our oversight responsibilities. Uh, as somebody who has had the privilege of serving in all three branches of government, both as a judge, as attorney general of Texas, and now as a legislator, I can tell you that John Ratcliffe has the personal integrity and intelligence to be able to understand the difference between being a legislator and being the director of national intelligence. These are simply different roles to be played while discharging our government responsibility. So I think that's something you might want to ask him more about, something I hope he will address. But I've known John personally for 10 years, and I'm proud to support his nomination. I can give you my strongest personal recommendation. The chairman has mentioned his experience on the House Intelligence and Judiciary Committee as well as the Ethics Committee. I do believe that as a former U.S. attorney, he does understand, and as a current member of the House Intelligence Committee, he does understand the vast threats our country is facing and the challenges that we face which lie ahead. We need to be able to count on a leader who operates free of personal and political motivation, serving only with the security and safety of the American people in mind. And I believe John Ratcliffe is the person to do that job. Prepared to continue the legacy of outstanding leadership we've come to expect and count on from the DNI, and I have confidence in his ability to serve as a steadfast leader and advocate for the intelligence professionals of the IC and a trusted partner with this committee. So, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Warner, I appreciate your careful consideration of my friend and fellow Texan, John Ratcliffe, and appreciate the opportunity to introduce him today. Thank you very much. Senator Warner, thank you for that introduction. With that, Congressman Ratcliffe, if you would rise and raise your right hand, you solemnly swear to give the committee the truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please be seated. Before we move to your statement, I'll ask you five standard questions the committee poses to each nominee who appears before us. They just require a simple yes or no answer. One, do you agree to appear before the committee here and in other venues when invited? Yes. If confirmed, do you agree to send officials from your office to appear before the committee and designated staff when invited? Yes. Do you agree to provide documents or any other materials requested by the committee in order for it to carry out its oversight and legislative responsibilities? Yes. Will you ensure that your office and staff provide such materials to the committee when requested? Yes. And five, do you agree to inform and fully brief the committee to the fullest extent possible? All members of this committee of the intelligence activities and covert action rather than only the chair and the vice chair? Yes. I want to thank you very much. It's my intention to move to a committee vote on this nomination as soon as possible. Therefore, for planning purposes, any member who wishes to submit questions to the record after today's hearing, please do so quickly. We will now proceed to your opening statement, after which I'll recognize members by seniority for five minutes. As discussed earlier, members will have the opportunity to ask follow-up questions in the blocks that are designated. So let me say for the purposes of members, we have 30-minute blocks. There is time allotted in that block for additional questions. There is not time in that block for everybody to have five minutes of additional questions. And I will state for members as the vice chairman and I have talked, at the end of 30 minutes, regardless of where we are in that block with those senators, I will cut it off because we've got a dead stop for the room at 12 o'clock. So I thank every member for their accommodations with that. Congressman Radcliffe, the floor is yours. Chairman Burr, Vice Chairman Warner, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to appear before you today as the President's nominee to be the next Director of National Intelligence. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts of the committee staff, my own staff, as well as many officers at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence who helped get us here today. I appreciate their dedication in making today possible. I'd also like to share a few thoughts on the challenging times we face today. The COVID-19 pandemic has cut short the lives of over 67,000 Americans. 
It has sickened over one million Americans, and it has impacted every one of us. My deepest sympathies are with those we've lost, and I salute the efforts of those on the front lines, including the dedicated intelligence community professionals reporting for duty and carrying out their mission. These are truly trying times, and your courage, honor, and sacrifice will not be forgotten. I'd like to begin by thanking President Trump for his incredible opportunity for me to serve our nation and for his confidence in me. I'd also like to thank former U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft for his gracious and humbling statement. I am forever grateful for your faith in me. I also want to recognize and thank Senator Cornyn for his kind words and my fellow Texans for their support. It has been the privilege of my life to represent the constituents of Texas's fourth congressional district. Finally, and most importantly, there's no way I could be with you today without the encouragement and support of my family. I'd like to recognize and thank my amazing wife, Michelle, our truly wonderful daughters, Riley and Darby, my mom, Kathy, and my five brothers and sisters, Kitty, Bob, Karen, Pam, and Larry. Watching from above, I'm sure, is my late dad, Robert Ratcliffe. My career in public service is a direct reflection of my family's selflessness, their sacrifice, their enduring love of country, and for me. I simply don't have the words to adequately express my gratitude. My journey here today has been a mixture of public service and private sector experience. I graduated college at age 20, law school at age 23, tried my first case at age 24. A decade later, I was managing a partner of my own law firm, and by most measures, I was successful. But something was missing. As the son of two public school teachers, I was taught from an early age the virtues of public service and self-sacrifice. Reflecting back, I realized it was those values that pushed me to a higher calling, one of service to the American people. The catalyst for me came on September 11, 2001. When the first plane struck, I was sitting on the 35th floor of a high-rise office building in Dallas, Texas that looked a whole lot like the ones in New York that were under attack. I watched so many Americans give their lives that terrible day, and in the months that followed, I watched many more sacrifice so much to defend the United States. And it inspired me to take stock of all the gifts that I have been given and what I might contribute to the defense of this great nation. Within a few years, I changed careers altogether. I left that civil law practice behind to become a federal prosecutor in the United States Department of Justice. And during my four years in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Texas. I served as Chief of Anti-Terrorism and National Security, First Assistant U.S. Attorney, and finally U.S. Attorney. My daily responsibilities involve leading, managing, directing, and prosecuting national security cases and related matters, including domestic and international terrorism, drug and human trafficking, transnational crime, and illegal immigration, among others. I led and managed the district's Joint Terrorism Task Force activities and worked closely with Justice Department officials and FBI on terrorism prevention, the overriding priority for the Department of Justice. In these roles, I came to appreciate the value of coordinated and integrated interagency efforts and the importance of timely, accurate, and objective intelligence in keeping Americans safe. For the past six years, I've been fortunate to serve with you all here in Congress. I've continued to prioritize national security issues, seeking assignments on the House Intelligence, Judiciary, and Homeland Security Committees. Although serving the citizens of the 4th Congressional District of Texas has been the honor of a lifetime, I believe that my passion for service, combined with my experience, my abilities, and my judgment, make me the right person to now successfully lead the men and women of the intelligence community. If confirmed as DNI, my top priority will be to present the President, senior policymakers, and this committee with objective and timely intelligence to better inform decisions about the future and safety of our great nation. As the President's principal intelligence advisor, I would ensure that all intelligence is collected, analyzed, and reported without bias, prejudice, or political influence. I see the Director of National Intelligence as more than just a leader, a manager, an integrator. The DNI must at all times be an arrow catcher, a problem solver, an obstacle mover for the IC, addressing issues, resolving conflicts, and putting tools and resources in the right place at the right time, and always, always 
Mr. Dean, I must be the voice to advocate for and defend the interests of the IC and its people. He confirmed his DNI. You have my commitment to deliver timely, accurate, and objective intelligence and to speak truth to power. Be that with Congress or within the administration. Let me be very clear. Regardless of what anyone wants our intelligence to reflect, the intelligence I will provide, if confirmed, will not be impacted or altered as a result of outside influence. Above all, my fidelity and loyalty will always be to the Constitution and the rule of law, and my actions as DNI will reflect that commitment. Many of you have asked me what I see as the greatest threats facing our nation. The reality is that the threat landscape today is diverse, dynamic, and geographically diffuse, more so than ever before. I believe the immediate focus of the IC must be directed to the geopolitical and economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic, as well as its origins. The American people deserve answers, and if confirmed, I pledge that the IC will remain laser-focused on providing them. We face enduring challenges on other fronts as well. These include China, from the race to 5G, preventing cyber espionage, Russia and its continued efforts to undermine our democracy by interfering in free and fair elections, Iran and its continued pursuit of nuclear capabilities, ballistic missiles, and sponsorship of terrorist groups, North Korea and its continued possession of nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and transnational issues like cybersecurity, safeguarding our supply chains, and of course, preventing terrorist attacks or a resurgence of ISIS. This list is by no means exhaustive. To address the full spectrum of threats and threat actors, the IC must work continuously to earn the trust of the President, the Congress, and the American people. At its core, the DNI position is about leadership. If confirmed, I hope to be a stabilizing force to build trust and break down barriers to information sharing as warranted in order to sharpen the analytic work of the intelligence community. For me, the ODNI remains the office best position to lead integration of the intelligence community. We can never underestimate the value of truly integrated intelligence operations or analysis or assume that agencies would do so on their own without strong leadership from above. That said, I believe every government agency must constantly review its operations to ensure it is setting the right priorities, achieving mission objectives, and spending taxpayer dollars effectively and efficiently. If confirmed, I will work with IC leaders to assess what is working well and where we need to make adjustments to make the community more effective, efficient, and resilient. In closing, to remain the world's premier intelligence enterprise, the IC must continue to recruit and retain the best, brightest, and most diverse workforce our nation has to offer. The men and women of the IC are dedicated civil servants who rarely, if ever, receive the full recognition of their sacrifice to country and dedication to the mission of keeping Americans safe, secure, and free. As DNI, there will be no greater champion of their hard work and dedication to this country than me. I'm honored by the opportunity to be here with you today, and I thank you for your consideration of my nomination during these difficult times. I look forward to answering your questions. Congressman, thank you for those remarks. We'll go into the first block of time consumed by the Chair of the Vice Chair, Senator Rich, Senator Feinstein, and Senator Rubio. Members will have up to five minutes. I'll try to bank some time. Congressman Radcliffe, several questions. When you're confirmed to be DNI, you'll be walking into an organization that's been led for quite some time by acting officials. It applies to the position for which you've been nominated, but also, more recently, to the Inspector General's office. Independence and ability to speak truth to power are critical in both offices. Can you speak to your views of the importance of the intelligence community's Inspector General and your expectations of what the office, of that office as DNI? Senator, thank you for the question. You made reference to acting officials. I have been an acting official for a period of time. I was acting U.S. Attorney, so I have an appreciation for why Senate-confirmed leadership 
does make a difference and is important, and I appreciate this committee um, considering me in that regard. I also appreciate the comments that you've made, as has uh, Vice Chairman Warner, about speaking truth to power, and I very much intend to do that if confirmed as DNI. With regard to the Inspector General position, I have a strong record of supporting and defending and working with the Inspector General. For example, I have publicly defended um, Inspector General Michael Horowitz, even when some of my colleagues have criticized his work, and even when I have disagreed with some of his opinions. But I understand the role and the importance of the Inspector General because there will always be misconduct, waste, fraud, and abuse um, when you have government. Um, I am very committed, if confirmed as DNI, to working with the Inspector General um, to make sure that the intelligence community has that type of process in place to ensure that the intelligence community is always acting in the best interest of the American people. Congressman, over the course of the last three years, this committee has issued four reports about Russia meddling in our elections covering Russia's intrusions into state election systems, their use of social media to attempt to influence the election, and most recently confirming the findings of the 2017 Intelligence Community Assessment. While being mindful of the fact that we're um, in an unclassified setting, what are your views on Russia's meddling in our elections? Chairman, my views are that Russia meddled in you know, or interfered with active measures in 2016, they interfered in 2018, they will attempt to do, that, do so in 2018. They, uh, they have a goal of sowing discord, and they have been successful in sowing discord. Fortunately, based on the work, the good work of this committee, we know that they may have been successful in that regard, but they have not been successful in changing votes or the outcome of any election. The intelligence community, as you know, plays a vital role in ensuring that we have safe secure and credible elections and that every vote cast by every American is done so properly and counted properly. Will you commit to bringing information about threats to the election infrastructure and about foreign governments' efforts to influence elections to Congress so we're fully and currently informed? I will. Will you commit to testify at this committee's annual worldwide threats hearing? I will. And last question, I mentioned that over the past three years we have issued four reports. Number five is finished. Number five will go for declassification. Do we have your commitment as DNI that you would expeditiously go through the declassification process? We do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You actually took some of my questions. <clears throat> my eyesight is good. <laughs> um, uh, Radcliffe, again, good to see you, and I appreciate our time. Um, um, last Friday. I, I want to follow up on a couple of the chairman's questions first. You, know, As we discussed, we are volume five, and so far our first four volumes have all been unanimous, or I think maybe with the exception of one dissenting vote. You know, If we get this um, document to the ODNI, you know, we need your commitment not only that we do it expeditiously, but as much as possible to get that volume five reviewed, redacted, and released, ideally before the August um, the August recess. Now, I know you've not seen the report yet. All I would ask is aspirationally that you commit to that goal because I think as we discussed, to have, have a document that could be potentially significant come out in the midst of a presidential campaign isn't good or fair on either side. So if I could clarify a little bit, recognizing that you've not seen the document, is a thousand pages, that you would try to get this uh, cleared prior to August. Vice Chairman, I will uh, again commit that I will work with you to get that uh, declassified as expeditiously as possible. Again, our goal is to get out before August. On, um, <clears throat> again, following up on the chairman's comments, um, and we, we talked about this in, in person, but I want for the committee and for the public record, you've indicated that you do believe that Russia interfered. What this committee's judgment was, um, 
putting a volume of four, but throughout all volumes, was that not only did Russia interfere, but during their interference in 2016, had a they had a selected candidate they were for and a selected candidate they were against for candidate Trump against candidate Clinton. Um, have you had a chance to review our our documents and have you reached a similar conclusion, uh, a conclusion that actually reinforces the, the unanimous conclusion of the intelligence community assessment or uh, can you comment on on our body four? Yeah, Senator, um, I very much appreciate the bipartisan approach that this committee addressed that issue. I did have a chance to review volume four, um, which I know um, uh, confirms the IC assessment. Um, I have no reason to dispute the committee's findings. I will say that I have no reason to dispute the committee uh, that I serve on, the House Intelligence Committee's findings, which is a different perspective with regard to the one issue that you mentioned about a preference for a candidate. Um, I have, I was not on the committee at that time. I have not, I respect both committees, um, but I have not seen the underlying intelligence to tell me why there is a difference of opinion uh, between the two committees. Um, but I, again, very much appreciate uh, volume four and the work that this committee put in. And again, I would reiterate the most important takeaway from the findings, I think, of uh, both committees is that if Russia continues to sow discord, uh, that they have not been successful in changing votes or the outcome of election, and we can remain committed to making sure that that does not happen in the future. Uh, respectfully, to, to me, to make that kind of assessment and to decide how we're going to prevent Russia's further interference in 2020, if they have a clear preference for one candidate over another, that would just also alter how we counter those efforts. So uh, I really hope that you will spend the time and look at the underlying intelligence. If you find that you reach a conclusion that is different than the unanimous conclusion of the intelligence community or the unanimous conclusion of this of the sissy here, I, I would expect a, a, a brief on that and, and pointing out how you found our conclusions or the IC's conclusions were inaccurate. You, you commit to come back to us if you reach a different conclusion once you review that underlying intelligence. One of the things we also discussed in uh, <clears throat> an area of the of the community that seems under assault with the acting ODNI, and that is the election security unit. Uh, there's obviously different parts of the IC. The NSA has a group. The IC has, a third, or the CIA has a group. But one of the most important is the group uh, that is uh, stood up, uh, it was stood up by Director Coates, uh, includes uh, intelligence professionals like. Shelby Pearson, um, they have briefed us on a regular basis. I would like your commitment that since we are literally less than six months away from this year's presidential elections, uh, that you will not take any efforts to dismantle the current leadership of the election security unit or the current capabilities of the election security unit um, this close to the 2020 election. Senator, I have no intention of making changes in that regard. And that that unit, should they have data that is relevant and appropriate uh, for this committee's responsibility, that that unit will be able to continue on a regular basis to brief this committee. Senator, I, I want to make sure that I'm clear throughout the day that if confirmed as BNI and I look at the global threat landscape, I, I mentioned the global pandemic and, and the IC role with respect to that. But the other immediate concern is safe, secure, credible elections. And I will do everything to make it my highest priority to confirm, to do everything possible that we have those safe, secure, credible elections in 2020. But it's important that, again, that that group who has briefed this committee on a regular basis continues to have that ability to brief. Uh, and again, echoing what the chairman has said, and I don't 
Last question then. Um, should you be confirmed, you know, we are already past due date on um, when we would have a, uh, the traditional worldwide threat hearing. Uh, you committed to the chairman um, that you would, um, you would hold that hearing. Uh, my hope would be that you, that commitment will take place within 60 days of, of you being confirmed. Senator, I'll make a commitment to, um, I look forward to confirm to appearing as a DNI in a worldwide don't want to make a commitment in terms of time that I don't know what I'm promising exactly. What I will make the commitment is that if confirmed, um, I agree that it's important and I will um, work to make that happen as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Congressman Radcliffe has been uh, incredibly uh, generous with his time with me. I've had an opportunity to uh, spend some time with him. I have all the questions that uh, I need answered from him already. Indeed, uh, most of them aren't uh, uh, available for uh, discussion in you know, open setting like this. But uh, in the interest of keeping you on time and on schedule, uh, I'm going to yield back my time since I do have to answer some questions. So thank you. I'd like to send a direction with that for Senator Biden's time. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman, welcome. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about whistleblowers, if I might. Um, this committee is adhered to a tradition of protecting whistleblowers. However, it's my understanding that your participation in President Trump's campaign to punish and discredit one IC whistleblower suggests you do not align yourself with this bipartisan approach. Let me give you an example. During a December 11 hearing of the House Committee on the Judiciary, you claimed without any evidence that the whistleblower got caught making a false statement. On December 12th, you tweeted that the whistleblower didn't tell the truth, both verbally and in writing. You also attacked HIPSI staff for providing guidance to potential whistleblowers on how to lawfully make a disclosure. Here's the question. If you are confirmed, do you believe that your past remarks concerning the Ukraine whistleblower will discourage IC whistleblowers from exercising their rights, consistent with the law, to make protected disclosures? Senator, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I want to make it very clear. Um, if confirmed as DNI, Every whistleblower, past, present, and future, will enjoy every protection under the law. Um, I don't want to relitigate old uh, issues of, of, of what happened during uh, uh, the impeachment inquiry. My issue was not with uh, the whistleblower. My issue was with what I perceived as a, a lack of due process in the House process. Um, there, Again, I don't want to relitigate the issue, so I'll leave it at that. But every whistleblower can expect full protection under the law. Whistleblowers are so important. A whistleblower in a uh, doctor in China is one of the reasons we got um, an earlier warning. So uh, I'll make that commitment to you, Senator. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, on the evening of April 3rd, President Trump announced that he was firing Mr. Atkinson because he had sought to transmit to Congress a credible whistleblower complaint of urgent concern, one that was required by law to be transmitted to Congress. Um, do you share the belief of members of this committee and the Senate that Mr. Atkinson was improperly fired, despite the fact, as Acting Director McGuire said, he did everything by the book and followed the law? Senator, I appreciate the um, question, and I think before you entered the room, I, I talked about my history and strong support um, of working with Inspector Generals. I talked about Inspector General Horowitz, who was someone I went to when I thought there was a problem with the misuse of intelligence authorities. 
um, and, um, and very much appreciated his approach and work and some of the concerns that I raised um, presented, in, presented in his findings in his report. With respect to um, Inspector General Atkinson and the situation that you described, I don't have enough information to answer your question, and if I can do it, if I can explain why. Um, I will tell you that my dealings with Inspector General Atkinson, um, I had no issues. Um, I think he did what he thought was right. I, I think he did think that he was following the law. The flip side to that is that um, the legal opinion within the ODNI from the General Counsel and from the Department of Justice um, Office of Legal Counsel, uh, my reading of it is that uh, their determination was may have exceeded his authority because um, uh, the investigation involved issues that uh, were not intelligence activity or intelligence community employees. That's a legal question that I, I don't know the answer to. Um, again, I very much want to reiterate that um, if confirmed, <coughs> how important inspector generals are uh, in government and my strong uh, history of working with them, and I understand, uh, although he's in an acting capacity, that Inspector General um, Tom Monheim is uh, in that role. I don't know him, but he's a 30-year veteran, very well respected, so I hope to have the opportunity to work with him. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. If concerned, do you commit to directing all IC agencies to cooperate fully with congressional oversight requests regarding COVID-19? and to promptly produce the full membership and staff of the Congressional Intelligence Committees, all intelligence requested by Congress regarding COVID-19. Uh, Senator, thanks for the question. And that's meant to be broad. It, it is, and, I, and I appreciate uh, the question in, in my opening remarks, um, and then I think reiterating uh, in one of my responses, that the immediate concern that I have um, is getting answers from the American people through the intelligence community if confirmed. The, if confirmed, the intelligence community will be laser focused on getting all of the answers that we can regarding how this happened, when this happened, um, and I commit to providing with as much transparency to you as uh, the law will allow and with due regard for sources and methods um, that everything be provided as quickly as possible. Thank you. Just a couple of questions quickly about yes. hard targets. In your view, is the IC doing enough to collect against hard targets like North Korea? Uh, Senator, as you know, the challenge um, with, uh, with North Korea is visibility. And um, I think that the, my impression from the outside, like you, as a member of an oversight committee of intelligence, is that, that we have very good collection. And I'm only caveating it because if confirmed as DNI, I may have a different viewpoint or more information to look at. Um, I would make it a priority. Uh, you know, I think uh, collection, obviously, and analysis of intelligence is what makes this the greatest intelligence enterprise in the world. And I will commit that if we are not doing enough, Senator, I will make it a high priority to improve um, any standards that we may need to um, employ. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, congratulations on the nomination. I think that's uh, people all want to know. Um, I mean, we've gotten to know each other a little bit over the years, not in the in the setting of intelligence, but the, the mutual friends. So. I just kind of want to ask you a very simple, straightforward question. Um, you have an accomplished career. You are, by electoral standards, in a seat that would be considered by the Cook Report as a safe district. Um, you seem to be enjoying your work. Why are you doing this? And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, you know, obviously, you've exposed yourself to criticism and the climate today and politics is pretty intense. I think the most fundamental question is why, why is this a job that you are willing to step forward and do at this time? Senator, I appreciate the, the question and I appreciate the time that we get to get to know each other when we come, to, come over to the lower house uh, to visit with us. Um, first of all, I think anytime the president asks you to do something for your country, you ought to consider 
there's a way for you to salute smartly and say uh, yes. Um, but beyond that, you have to want this job. And uh, for the same reason I, in my opening, talked about leaving a uh, successful law practice to make a fraction of that to be a federal prosecutor. The, the mission is too important. And, and what the intelligence community um, means, how it has positioned the United States as the world superpower, and I think everyone knows that um, the relationship um, between the intelligence community, Congress, the president, across the board right now is something that's um, at issue. We've got intelligence authorities and their uses being questioned. Um, I realize it's a, sort of a difficult time, but the I again, the core responsibility is leadership, and it's easy to raise your hand when things are going perfectly. It's harder to raise your hand when they're not, and uh, the mission's too important of keeping Americans safe and the opportunity um, to lead uh, is something that I want to do, and I guess I will say this, it's been the privilege of my life to serve as a member of Congress, um, but the best job I ever had was to be the United States Attorney, and what I loved about it was it was an apolitical position. I stood up always to represent the United States of America, never one party or another, and um, I very, very much view that as this role for the DNI. I look forward to treating every member, Republican and Democrat, exactly the same way, um, and, uh, and frankly, being out of politics. I mean, that's, that's a, an important question because I've heard some of the skepticism that's been raised is about experience and the experience needed to lead uh, this intelligence enterprise. And <clears throat> it's my view, you actually have pretty extensive experience, both as uh, on the committee in the, in the House, uh, both in on online security and intelligence, and also in judiciary, and then the work that as a U.S. attorney. What is it in what you have done over the last, you know, or during your career that you believe prepares you best for the role you now have of sort of overseeing all of these different uh, pillars of our intelligence capabilities? Well, I think as was mentioned earlier, I've now seen intelligence um, from three different vantage points as, a, as an end user and a, and a developer, um, as a consumer of intelligence, um, and as an overseer of intelligence. And um, as far as experience, um, I started handling national security issues back in 2005, and, um, and that included intelligence authorities. My first exposure with FISA was 2005, and in trying to respond to this committee, we found that uh, in at least one in in instance, the authorities that I uh, used uh, remain, uh, the, uh, the matters that I worked on remain classified. So from an experience standpoint, um, as far back as 2005, I've been um, using those authorities. But I think the, the role of U.S. Attorney in particular, and, and, um, uh, and my time as Chief of Anti-Terrorism for four years, uh, is particularly well suited and analogous to the DNI. So as U.S. Attorney, I was running a federated enterprise, uh, working across federal agencies, uh, integrating, coordinating, sharing information, um, and doing so in an apolitical way. And, and that's very much what the uh, Director of National Intelligence uh, um, integrates and coordinates across all 17 intelligence agencies, making the community better so that it can make members of Congress, the President, um, and our uh, policymakers better informed on national security decisions. My time in Congress as well, the committees that I've been on, legislating, creating national security laws, um, I think I've got uh, a broad, deep, um, and more than qualified level of experience when we talk about national security issues. And I also think I've got some good judgment because I've identified when there are problems with the use of intelligence authority, and I've spoken to power when I've seen it misused. Well, I enthusiastically support your nomination, and um, I look forward to voting for you on the committee and again on the floor. Thank you.
I've been very concerned by the growth of contractors over the last 20 plus years in the agencies. And um, it, when I was chairman of the committee, we made a big push to ensure that all inherently government functions of the IC were performed by government employees and not contractors. It's my understanding that that effort continues today. And we made substantial progress over the two decades in this. What is your view on the appropriate use of contractors in the um, intelligence community? Uh, Senator, I'm, I'm not saying this because um, if you're considering me for uh, the position as a nominee, but I agree with every word you just said with regard to contractors' use and how it should be limited and where government employees should be doing government functions. I know there's always um, uh, a, a look in terms of uh, uh, ratios and, and percentages. I'm not a one-size-fits-all person and confirmed at DNI. I'll look at where things stand right now, but the concern that you have, the sentiment that you express, um, let me just uh, reiterate that I agree with you completely and look forward to working with you on this issue if confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Uh, with that, the uh, first block of time has expired. The chair would move to the second block of time and go somewhat out of order because uh, Senator Biden's not here. I will turn to Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman, I appreciated the opportunity to talk with you last week as one of the authors, along with Senator, former Senator Joe Lieberman, of the 2004 law that created the Director of National Intelligence Position, I have a special interest in making sure that the leader of the intelligence community fulfills what we envision. In that regard, I appreciate the opportunity to review your background with you in depth to make sure uh, that you met the statutory standard of having extensive national security expertise. So today, I want to turn to a different issue. As some members have already said today, the ability to speak truth to power is essential to serving as a successful DNI. Would you communicate the intelligence community's analytic views to the president, even if you knew that he would strongly disagree with them? Would you be willing to communicate the IC's analytic conclusions to the president even if you believe it would place your job in jeopardy. When, assuming your confirmation, when you participate in the next open worldwide threats hearing and you are asked to provide an unclassified IC assessment that you know that the president vehemently disagrees with, what would you do? Senator, whether you're talking about the president or you're talking about um, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, um, anyone's views on what they want the intelligence to be will never impact the intelligence that I deliver. Never. Thank you for that strong response. I'm nevertheless going to ask you one more that has to do with the internal operations of the intelligence community. What would you do if the intelligence community was prepared to publish a President's Daily Brief that directly contradicted the White House's conclusions on an important issue like North Korea? Would you still allow the PDB to be published? And the reason I ask this question is there are some very experienced analysts within the IC that are concerned that you might attempt to shade the conclusions 
in the order to avoid alienating the president um, in presenting his daily brief. Senator, I, I, uh, I think before you were in the room, I, I sort of reiterated um, multiple times that um, I won't shake intelligence for anyone, um, whether we're talking about the president, members of Congress, any policymakers. Um, as far as published on the, the president's daily brief, um, you know, it's, it's, um, I guess I'm not sure the word publish when you say uh, how you mean that? I should, I should have used the word issue. So a, a, absolutely, um, I, I just want to make sure because the president's daily brief is the is the president's daily brief. Right. Brief. And um, uh, uh, but uh, to that to the larger question, um, again, just if I can reiterate as clearly as possible, um, if confirmed as DNI, one of the things that I've made clear to everyone. Um, uh, is that I will deliver the unvarnished truth. It won't be shaded for anyone. What anyone wants the intelligence to reflect won't impact the intelligence that I deliver. And finally, and I ask this question to you on the telephone, but I want to ask it to you for the record. The president has said that the IC has run a month and needs to be reined in. Do you share the president's view? I think what we talked about, Senator, about a number of things there, um, and, and I'm, I'm sure going to get a lot of questions about what the president says or what the president thinks, and I, again, I don't mean to be repetitive, but um, none of those things, regardless of what he says or how he says them, uh, or how Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell or anyone um, says about the intelligence or the intelligence will not impact the intelligence that I deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Congressman, welcome. And Thank you. let me begin uh, this way. Donald Trump said last year, the Constitution says, and I quote here, I can do whatever I want as president. The Attorney General has said the President doesn't have to follow the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and can conduct surveillance without a warrant. Those two statements are a direct threat to the constitutional rights of Americans, and it makes the Director of National Intelligence a last line of defense for our democracy. Do you believe the president can spy on Americans outside the law? And I would say, like Senator, I don't think anyone can spy on Americans outside the law. So would you refuse to authorize the intelligence community to conduct warrantless surveillance? Senator, uh, I... Uh, you, you answered. You answered no. So I'm asking. I, just to be you, real clear. My answer is consistent with whatever the law is. Is what is what I will do as is confirmed as he and I within my authorities. Um, I will act within my authority, but most importantly, I will be guided by the Constitution and the, and the rule of law. So whatever authorities uh, allow the intelligence community to do, um, all of our actions. If I'm the director, will be in compliance. What the law is. My, my, my time is short, Con Congressman. The point is, you really didn't say no in answer to my question. You said there may be circumstances. I happen to think that answer that there may be circumstances when the president can spy on Americans outside the law is an exceptionally dangerous I, testimony, a bit of testimony. Maybe, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Maybe, can I just, for the record, clear? Maybe I misspoke then. I, I want to be real clear that no one can spy or surveil outside the law. And it's, if confirmed as DNI, um, one of my highest priorities will always be to make sure that the intelligence community is acting in accordance with the law. Um, so I want to make that very clear, Senator. Again, you're qualifying this based on circumstances, and that's 
what I think is dangerous. Now, I also want to get into your views on whistleblowers. Now, it is open season on whistleblowers right now in Washington, D.C. You gave a pleasant sounding statement about whistleblowers, so I want to be very specific. If the Inspector General determines that a whistleblower complaint should be sent to Congress, are you going to send it over to the Department of Justice or the White House to get their permission? Any whistleblower complaint, if I'm confirmed as DNI, is going to be handled in accordance with the law. Um, as you know, I don't know how it can be more clear than that. Oh, I, I think you could say unequivocally no, because that's what I think is important. And what I want to know is whether there's some kind of veto power over whether Congress hears from whistleblowers. And as with the previous question with respect to spying, you want to have it both ways. You want to try to portray yourself as the defender of the Constitution, and then you water it down with the specifics. Should the identity of whistleblowers ever, under any circumstances, be disclosed without their consent? No, whistleblowers are entitled to anonymity. So what is your opinion of those who would call for the outing of IC whistleblowers? That if uh, whistleblowers are entitled to anonymity uh, under the law, and if, uh, and if someone... Uh, well, are, are you distinguishing between lawful whistleblowers or lawful whistleblower complaints? Again, I, I'm trying to get a sense of what you actually believe. If, if someone is a... Uh, a whistleblower under the law, they are entitled to the protection of the whistleblower statute under the law. And I, I before you were in the room, I heard, I heard the answer. One last question, I want to get it in. Um, you, in your written answers, seem to think internet voting was okay. You gave a very qualified answer. I happen to think it's the equivalent of putting our ballots on the streets of Moscow. So could you tell me why you think internet voting is okay given all the threats that we have seen to our democracy? I don't recall the response or, or how I uh, how I responded, Senator, but um, it seems to me that that is a, a policy issue that is confirmed as DNI. Um, I would not be in the role of making policy. It wouldn't matter. Whatever the law is regarding... We, uh, we expect you to be a leader on election security. And if you support the kind of snake oil salesmen we've got in this country that are selling some of these online voting op operations, you are going to put at risk our special system of government. I think my time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Congressman. Uh, in your statement for the record, you wrote that, quote, the president and I have a good rapport. Um, so if confirmed as DNI, um, you said you have my commitment to deliver accurate and objective intelligence and speak truth to power. Dan Coates, Sue Gordon, Joe McGuire, other dedicated IC professionals had a good rapport president as well until they didn't. Can you give me some specific examples of when you've had to speak truth to power, in particular if it's involved the president of the United States? Sure. Um, uh, Senator, I appreciate the question. Um, the reason I said a good report is I think trust is important. I think it's one of the things that uh, is important to strengthen the relationship between um, all parties. Um, intelligence community, Congress, um, the President. Um, one of the reasons that I uh, indicated before you were in the room that, that I wanted this job was because it is apolitical, and I had held a political position before. Um, as U.S. Attorney, uh, that is an apolitical role, and um, in those instances, I frequently had to um, Truth to power from the standpoint of uh, there were many occasions where people wanted me to exercise my discretion in a way that considered something other than um, what the law was. Um, 
can we ever can you give a, a, a particular example? Um, uh, old so and so uh, is uh, you know uh, I want to give examples that would give away a specific case, but if someone was, for instance, a good Republican or a good Democrat um, and held a position and, and, and maybe uh, deserved some special consideration, those kinds of things. Um, uh, I, in addition, I, I think that's a, that's adequate. Uh, I, I just want to reclaim my time here for a moment. Uh, last year, the president uh, defended nominating you for the DNI position, stating that you would do an incredible job, and we need somebody like that in there. We need somebody strong that can rein it in, because as I think you're all, you've all learned, the intelligence agencies have run amok. Um, what do you think he meant by that? Um, I, uh, I don't know. I saw the comment, uh, Senator. Um, I've, I've made clear that, you know, again, uh, first of all, I've made clear, as I just said to you, one of the reasons that I want this position. Um, I've made that without betraying any uh, conversations, um, but that sentiment I have expressed to the president, and um, and he understands that um, that I'm looking forward to this position because it's uh, apolitical and that the intelligence that I will deliver is unvarnished or. Do, do you, you think that? that, that the intelligence community, or even a single agency, has run them up. I have never said that. Um, President Trump has repeatedly, and without any basis in my view, accused the hardworking men and women of the IC of working to undermine his administration. Um, do you think, do you believe that there is a uh, quote unquote deep state in the IC? I don't know what that means. Uh, Senator Collins and I, I think, talked about that in, in our call. I don't, I don't even know. I don't know what that is. So, would you agree that it would be inappropriate uh, and, in some contexts, illegal to remove or reassign, to screen or otherwise discriminate against career IC personnel for political reasons, including yes. on the basis of their work assignments in previous administrations? Yes. Thank you. Uh, The president has um, publicly stated that he expects loyalty from his appointees, and he publicly withdrew your nomination, appointed another individual, uh, but then formally resubmitted your nomination. That sort of turn of events just raises some unique questions. During your conversations with the president regarding this position, what priorities did he communicate to you that he expected you to pursue? Uh, on his behalf. And did the word loyalty ever come up? Um, Senator, a couple, couple of points there. I want to be real clear. Um, my loyalty is to the Constitution and the rule of law. And I have made that very clear to everyone, including the President. Um, so so you did discuss loyalty? Are, no, I, I've made clear that um, if I'm uh, in a position, my loyalty is always going to be to the Constitution and the rule of law. So you made that proactively clear. You weren't asked. Yeah, I made that proactively clear. Um, and you were and, not asked. And I was not. I absolutely was not asked. Okay. Um, and um, the priorities, one of the priorities, um, again, I don't want to get into um, specific conversations, but the, the sentiment is keeping politics out of the intelligence community. It's one of my priorities. Um, and I, and one thing to, to, I guess, because it's been reported, um, I withdrew from consideration. Um, uh, I wasn't withdrawn. And um, and so I just wanted the record uh, clear with respect to that. Senator Collins, do you have one additional question you'd like to ask? Chairman? Senator Wright, one additional question. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Congressman, the Congress passed a law requiring an unclassified report on who was responsible for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. This is a law today, not a bill, it is a law. The DNI, however, has outright refused to comply with this law 
denying the public a single shred of information on this topic. Do you agree that the government is bound by this law and is obligated to provide this report, which stipulates in public, in public, who killed Jamal Khashoggi and under what circumstances? Senator, um, I share your concern. I think I've seen the same information that you have, and I, I think you're referring to the provisions in the NDAA. Um, and if confirmed as DNI, uh, again, uh, I will ensure that, uh, uh, that the law is complied with. I uh, realize that the information, I think, in the report, if we're talking about the same thing, is um, uh, a request for unclassified information. Um, so if confirmed, I want to look myself at the information to make sure that that information has been classified properly. But that's not the question. This is a law. This is a law, Congressman, and consistently in every one of the areas that I ask you about, with respect to spying, with respect to whistleblowers, now with respect to the law, these are pretty much straightforward, yes or no questions, and now you've said you're going to look at what is classified with respect to the late Mr. Khashoggi. We passed a law that resolved it. It is supposed to be made available now. So I'll, 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 I'll look forward to your adding to the record uh, on it, but I, I will tell you, you have certainly been brief with respect to coming to this hearing, but on issue after issue, I've asked three straightforward questions, and what I have gotten is a kind of let us sort of circle the subject and not answer it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one. Um, as you know, Congress has not authorized organizational changes at ODNI. Uh, we have not appropriated funds for that purpose, but Acting Director Grinnell uh, has been reorganizing ODNI. If confirmed, would you halt that reorganization and would you seek uh, authorization, authorization from Congress to reorganize if you found the need to do so? Um, Senator, thanks for the question. If I can just first comment on uh, the Senator Wyden's point, I was hoping to make the point that uh, I'm certainly not trying to be um, uh, evasive, but the, the position I'm being considered for is the President's principal intelligence advisor, not, not his legal advisor, and there is, there is legal counsel that, that I would go to if I were confirmed as DNI. But, um, uh, uh, Senator, I, I appreciate the question about um, organizational changes. Um, uh, as you know, I, I, I have. Um, uh, I'm not so presumptuous as to, to, to know that I'm going to be confirmed, so I haven't uh, considered or uh, talked about uh, any sort of organizational changes. Uh, I want to make clear that, it can, that, that I expect to have unfettered discretion to make um, all personnel decisions uh, if confirmed as DNI, and I'll make them in the best interest of the IC to make the IC better. Um, and I will certainly, as with everything, uh, work with this committee to keep it fully and currently informed. Um, I, I, I want everyone to sort of remember that um, I'm being considered for this position, but I'm one of you right now as a member of an oversight committee, and um, uh, America functions better when its elected representatives are fully informed by um, the intelligence community, and I intend to do that. With that, I will bring to a close uh, the block, the second block of members' questions, and we'll move to the third block. Anybody who's asked questions uh, is excused if they'd like to leave. Let me remind members that when we conclude with this at 12 o'clock, we will reconvene in closed session at 2 o'clock in the Capitol uh, Senate Security uh, Building, and we will again be operating with. Uh, blocks of time, and there will be a conference room there for anybody that would like to sit, read intelligence products, listen to uh, what's going on in the closed hearing, and then come in for their, their question period. Uh, with that, uh, I recognize Senator Blunt. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Congressman Brancliffe, it's uh, good to have you here. Uh, this uh, job has gone vacant for too long. It's a critically important job. I'm glad you've been nominated. I've read with great interest uh, the um, 
letter in uh, the record that was given to us from uh, former Attorney General Ashcroft. He's been a good friend of mine for a long time. I trust his judgment. I know you worked with him as a uh, U.S. Attorney and also in a law firm that was formed after you both left the Justice Department. And uh, his view of you, which he shared with me personally as well as in this letter, is significant. Uh, we've had a chance to visit about uh, your work on the House Intelligence Committee, and I particularly appreciated your last comment about the importance of being fully open and an oversight committee like this one being uh, fully informed. I, I would say that when we stood up this structure after 9-11, uh, I, I certainly anticipated a much smaller coordinating uh, opportunity rather than the bureaucratic size that we can see today. I, I, I hope when you have a chance to look at this that you'll look carefully at whether or not the structure as it's grown has really served the principal purpose of coordinating information or if in some way it may have created yet one more stovepipe of information. I'd like you to comment on your views, maybe as a House Intel member, of uh, just the size of BNI itself and if that size is one you think is too big, too small, or just right. Senator, thank you for the, um, for the uh, remarks and um, association with uh, former General, uh, Attorney General John Ashcroft, the great American. Um, and, um, but I, like you, um, come into this position and confirm with some preconceived impressions based on um, discussions I've had on the Oversight Committee. And as Senator Collins leaves the room, um, I want to make sure, uh, you know, one of the goals of the, of the DNI, uh, if confirmed, is to make sure that the ODNI and the DNI position are working exactly like Senator Collins and those who stood it up intended it. And so I had a chance to visit with her about it. Um, like you, I come in with the perspective that um, you have conversations that maybe indicate that there is too much bureaucracy um, and there's too much redundancy. Um, some redundancy is good, but if there's 17 agencies, they don't need to be doing the same thing 17 times or purchasing the same thing. And so um, it'll be one of my immediate priorities um, to assess how um, the ODNI is functioning. Uh, again, I, the goal of the ODNI is to make the IC better so that the IC can make you better, the better and policy makers better. And so I do think that um, uh, I want it to be as efficient as possible, um, but I'll be thoughtful and talk with the heads of the intelligence uh, agencies and elements to find out where they think that some of these things may just be unnecessary redundancies um, and address those. You know, I think another question to ask, and you don't have to comment on this, but for you to ask is, is this this agency has grown, have we let the other agencies not have the attention or the staff they needed uh, as the whole uh, universe of intelligence, uh, U.S. intelligence has grown, uh, so much of it has grown at this point that was to be the central clearinghouse, the agency that coordinated information to be sure nobody was left out, and I would look at that. During the 19 years of, that we have, the last 19 years, we've very much been focused on violent um, terrorist extremist as the, the focus of so much of our uh, intelligence efforts. Certainly that threat has not gone away, but it's also equally as certain that great power competition has emerged in ways that we wouldn't have anticipated even a handful of years ago. Uh, talk a little bit about rebalancing the resources you have to continue to uh, keep uh, an eye on the threats that we have so focused on for almost two decades now, but also to rebalance into the great power competition that we see as a significant challenge for us today. Senator, great question, um, and I appreciate um, you asking because I've had that conversation with a lot of people about what I view as the greatest threat and the greatest threat actor, and I view 
China as the greatest threat actor right now. I mean, look at where we are uh, with respect to COVID-19 and the role that China plays, um, the race to 5G, uh, cybersecurity issues, all, all roads lead to China there. Um, and so uh, one of the uh, priorities, uh, highest priorities that I'll have as confirmed as BNI is to make sure, again, my background with, with regard to you know, violent extremists, um, you know, that is a generational challenge that we will continue to deal with. We may forget about them, but they don't forget about us. But I agree with you in terms of making sure if we look at the national um, intelligence framework and um, whether we're committing enough resources to the rising power that is China, when you look at the, the initiatives that they have, uh, uh, Belt and Road, the um, Made in China 2025, the, um, uh, all of the military civil fusion initiatives, um, where they literally want, by law, Chinese uh, companies to collect intelligence. These are all um, spokes of the same initiative, and that's for uh, China to um, supplant us as, as the world's superpower and to be able to set standards around the world. And, we very clearly don't want an authoritarian regime like the um, Chinese Communist Party setting standards in the world marketplace. And so um, uh, I look forward to sitting down with you and confirmed about how um, ODI and I and the, and the, uh, the other 16 elements um, are dedicated to the rising threat that is China, which I view as our greatest threat actor. Well, certainly Russia is another great threat. Do you want to talk about that for? Just a second as I conclude my questions. You bet. Um, di different just because, um, you know, uh, Russia, we are concerned with Russia in terms of uh, anytime you have a large nuclear stockpile, um, and they are certainly uh, dedicated to sowing seeds at this board. Um, we are most concerned with them with regard to election interference and making sure we have safe, secure, credible elections because. Um, that's what they have been focused on, and, and they've been, as I said earlier, they've been successful in sowing seeds of discord, but not, fortunately, in changing votes or the outcome. Um, but between the two, to be real clear, I view China as the rising power, um, uh, where Russia you know, has an economy about the same size as the economy in my home state of Texas. Um, so we need to be very concerned with them. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, is, is a very bad actor, and... Um, uh, and so as as he and I have confirmed, I want to make sure that we balance appropriately where our resources are going with regard to both of those threats. Well, thank you, Mr. Eckliffe. Uh, Congressman, I look forward to supporting your nomination thank both you. here in the committee and uh, on the floor, and uh, you're working with us as, as you get this job. Thank you. Good morning, Congressman. First, I'd like to start with a series of questions that are from the questionnaire, and I believe they can be answered with yes or no. They you did not answer them thusly in the questionnaire, but I think they can be easily answered with yes or no. The first one is question 35. Would you ever ask, encourage, or support an intelligence professional in adjusting his or her assessment to avoid criticism from the White House or political appointee? No. Would you ever change or remove content in an intelligence assessment for political reasons or at the behest of the No. Question 39. Would you consider an individual's personal political preferences to include loyalty to the president in making a decision to hire, fire, or promote him? And uh, question 39. Do you commit to exclusively consider professional qualifications and IC personnel decisions without consideration of partisan or political factors? Yes. Uh, C of 39. If you were to receive credible evidence in DNI that the individual was undermining IC objectivity and furthering a political agenda, would you immediately remove that individual? Yes. And D. Will you or any of your staff impose a political litmus test for IC employees? No. Finally, if confirmed, would you reassure your workforce that loyalty tests are not allowed with the IC? And if such occurs, would you commit to informing Congressional Intelligence Committee, 
committees and immediately stopping such efforts. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, can you give me a, a case where you have ever publicly differed with this president? Yes. Please do. Briefly. Uh, example I can think of most recently was, um, I think it was October, um, the president's decision to withdraw troops uh, from Syria. There was uh, a resolution uh, considered um, uh, regarding that issue uh, that I supported, that I think was referred to by some as a rebuke of the president. Um, I, think, I, think that, I think I'm right on the, the specifics of that. Any other incidents? Um, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, I, I don't recall any as I'm sitting here. In your position as a member of the House Intelligence Committee or as the nominee for BNI, have you seen any intelligence uh, that finds with high confidence or any confidence for that matter that the coronavirus originated in the lab in Wuhan rather than the market? I have not. Thank you. Uh, you can I, can I go ahead? I only want to caveat in the, in the sense of because of the, the pandemic, I, I, I want to say that the last um, classified briefing I had was sometime in. Uh, it's, it's been a while since I've had a classified briefing on the, the coronavirus pandemic. That's the only exactly. thing I want to caveat. That's the answer that I gave this morning myself. Okay. You, like me, you have not seen a intelligence product that indicates. I have not. Thank you. Uh, you uh, took the oath this morning from the chair and said uh, you will agree to appear and share information with the committee. Will you appear before this committee if the president or an official in the White House tells you not to? Of course. Uh, and uh, you will bring us, I think there's been some oh, questions of the worldwide threat here. You will. So, uh, when I, I will, uh, and I again not caveat, we say. Um, you gave the right answer. I, if I were you, I wouldn't qualify. And I'll just leave it alone. But, but the point was, I want to make sure we were talking about to appear in connection with the worldwide threat. Here. No, I'm talking about just generally. If this committee requests your attendance to testify and the White House says to do not go, will you honor the oath you took this morning? I will. I will. Sure, I will. I'm sure I understood the question properly. Thank you. Um, the President has stated that he feels that so called in enhanced interrogation, such as waterboarding, has value and produces valuable results. John McCain has said repeatedly that it does not. Who do you agree with, McCain or the president? I follow the law. I uh, always follow the law. And so what you belong that said, waterboarding I, is a violation of the anti-torture law? Uh, my understanding um, is that the law make, makes clear in several places that torture is illegal, and um, and and that would be uh, that would be the finding, I think, in the Army field, field manual. And, uh, so this has nothing to do with your personal opinion. You're, you're simply saying, I'll follow the law, but if the law was changed to allow waterboarding or, or other forms of torture, would you say that was okay? Um, I think the obligation that I have, Senator, is to follow the law. Uh, uh, the Constitution and law uh, of the country is the oath that I take um, in any role. As a member of Congress, I, mean, I, I don't want to get into policy decisions about which the DNI should not be involved in. I'm, I'm a policymaker now, but you're considering me for a role where I would not be making policy, or um, I would I would follow the law as legislators um, uh, create laws, or as the Supreme Court interprets those laws. Thank you. One final question: uh, In your, if, if you were running for re-election and your campaign manager shared polling data which included cross tabs and detailed information about where your campaign stood with a with an agent of a foreign government. Would you believe that was okay? No. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Reichlitz, congratulations on your nomination. Let me follow up on Senator King's questioning. He asked if you've seen any intelligence that the coronavirus um, originated in one of the two labs in Wuhan. And he said no. Have you seen any intelligence that supports the Chinese Communist Party's claim that it originated in a seafood market in Wuhan? No. Um, I, I presume you're aware that the respected scientific journal The Lancet published a study of Chinese scientists in January 
they concluded that, in fact, it did not originate in the market. I have. Um, that more than a third of the original cases had no contact with the market whatsoever, including what they believed to be the first known case as well. I didn't recall that, but I think that's what they reflect. Are you aware that, to the best of our knowledge, there's no evidence that bats of any kind, to include the horseshoe bat, was even sold in a that is food my, market? That is my understanding. So uh, I, this, I, just to be clear, I was just the point I was trying to make is it's been a while, and, and uh, through no one's fault, uh, since I've had a, an updated classified briefing regarding the coronavirus pandemic. I understand, and I, I'm asking those questions not just to speak about the virus, but more particular a matter of intelligence analysis. Everything that we just discussed is not clandestine collected information. It's not a national security secret. It is publicly reported in a journal like The Lancet or in news sources or so forth. Correct. Um, much of what we know about the virus is the result of publicly reported information or social media evidence from Wuhan in the early days and so forth. Um, how critical is the role of that kind of unclassified public information in the analysis that our intelligence committee should be conducting? It's uh, incredibly important. I think one of the things that, that we're seeing is OSINT, or you know, open source intelligence, um, is increasingly valuable, and we need to find ways to make sure that we're uh, collecting it and analyzing it. it it's a huge, there's this large sets of, of data that, that we need to um, be processing there. Um, and so it's a challenge, but it's a, it's a tremendous source of, of information um, and, and should be utilized by the intelligence community going forward. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's always a bias uh, towards thinking if, if a secret is not stolen through clandestine means, then it's not valuable information. When all of these uh, pieces of information, whether we're talking about the Chinese coronavirus or what Russia is up to in Europe or Iran's nuclear program, fits together into a mosaic. And that mosaic usually is a question of circumstantial evidence that you can use common sense to reach the best conclusion, not direct evidence, not conclusive proof. You want to respond? I, I was just going to say, to give you an example of how we might sort of uh, forward looking on this issue, open, uh, open source intelligence, if we use open source intelligence tools, um, we may be able to uh, get earlier warnings around um, pandemics like this or viruses like this um, as, they're, as they're beginning. So those are the types of, when I was referring to how the intelligence community can, can leverage um, open source information, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, um, moving on to one of the Director of National Intelligence chief responsibilities, which is setting the priorities for the kind of intelligence our nation needs to collect. Last week, the acting director of National Intelligence released a statement saying, the intelligence community will continue to rigorously examine emerging information and intelligence to determine whether the outbreak began through contact with infected animals or if it was a result of an accident at a laboratory in Wuhan. Um, the New York Times subsequently reported that senior national security officials, national security council officials, um, urge the intelligence community to collect additional information to the extent possible on the origin and cause of the Wuhan pandemic. The New York Times and other media outlets have somehow suggested that would be inappropriate. Is it inappropriate for the president to set collection priorities on what he thinks is urgent national questions and for you as DNI to drive those priorities as best you can? given the facts that our intelligence officers are able to gather, that would be appropriate. I think that would be completely and totally appropriate. That's exactly what we would expect the cabinet, or the president and his senior national security cabinet members to do. Um, one final question I have, I've heard a lot of questions about this on both sides today. Um, you're obviously a politician right now. You've got an R after your name. Um, some people have raised the question whether you can separate politics from intelligence. We've discussed in the past that, that this has been done successfully at times. If you look at someone like Leon Panetta, he's a pretty partisan guy when he was in the Congress and when he was Bill Clinton's chief of staff, um, but was an outstanding director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Or if you look at it from the other way, take someone like Bob Gates, lifelong intelligence professional, but since he's left the government, it's pretty clear to everyone that he's a Republican and he supported Republican candidates for office. Out of office, even though he served in the Democratic administration. 
Uh, I just want to point out, even those those are not the DNI job, but the director of central intelligence job. They have a similar um, need for separating politics from intelligence. So this is something that, that can be done, and it has been done in the past. And I just wanted to see if you have comments about those precedents or how you will separate politics from intelligence. Well, I uh, appreciate uh, the question, Senator. And um, earlier, I talked about the fact that, that I um, very much uh, love representing the people uh, here in Congress, but but I held an aid political job before as U.S. Attorney, one where um, I represented the United States and neither party, um, and kept uh, both parties out of everything that I did. Um, and uh, and so I, I have done that and done it successfully and been highly regarded for the way that I've approached that, and, and I enjoyed that. And it's one of the reasons that I'm going from a, a safe district and asking you all to consider me as a nominee. Um, I have every, um, not just every intention, but every confidence uh, that I will do exactly as I'm telling you, uh, that I will um, be entirely apolitical as the Director of National Intelligence. Thank you very much. Senator Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman, the U.S. intelligence community has an important role in warning our leaders about pandemics like COVID-19 because outbreaks, of course, are not just a public health matter, but also a matter of national security. Based on public statements and reporting alone, do you believe that President Trump has accurately conveyed the severity of the threat of COVID-19 to the American people? Are you saying presently? <clears throat> we are in the midst of the pandemic presently, correct? Um, so repeat the question, because I, I, I guess I'm misunderstanding. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Has he accurately reflected the, the status of the pandemic? Conveyed the severity of the pandemic, yes. Has he accurately conveyed the severity of COVID-19 to the American people? Um, I believe so. You do. Um, and according to April 27, 2020 Washington Post article, President Trump received upwards of a dozen briefings on COVID-19 from the U.S. intelligence agencies between January and February of this year, during which time he repeatedly denied the severity of the threat. On January 22nd, he said, quote, we have it totally under control. <clears throat> on February 22nd, or 26th, he insisted that the number of cases would be, quote, close to zero within a number of days. As recently as March 10th, the president stated, quote, just stay calm, it will go away. And I'm sure you're familiar with the most recent reports, including today, that we may see as many as 3,000 deaths a day in America because of COVID-19. What would you do if confirmed if you believe that the president was not taking the warning from the intelligence community seriously? that I would uh, deliver as the Director of National Intelligence. The, the statements that the, the President said this, none of those things will influence uh, the intelligence that I deliver to this committee and the committee in the House and members of Congress. Um, I made the point in my opening, this is one of the highest, the, the first priorities um, in getting answers to the American people deserve answers, and you do as, uh, as a member of the Oversight Committee, and I do if I'm still a member of the Oversight Committee. And whatever those answers are, Senator, you will get them. They won't be shaded, uh, regardless of what anyone says. I, I will say this, um, one of the things that I've learned as, as a nominee is that <coughs> um, members of the intelligence community uh, will tell you things that uh, they wouldn't tell you as, a, as an oversight uh, an overseer of the intelligence. And the thing that I, will, that I, that I want to make clear to, to all the members here is the concern of the, of the men and women in the intelligence community is they don't want to be leveraged by anyone on either side of the aisle. Well, and well with all due respect, sir, in my experience being on the intelligence committee in the United States Senate, the intelligence community, the community has been pretty important right for them when we ask the question in our role of oversight. So what exactly are you referring to? Just saying the perspective as uh, the conversations that I've had over the past few um, months as I have been considered for this, I've, I've, I've had exposure to uh, a, a lot of the intelligence community members who just expressed the sentiment that 
they, they want to do their job, they want to deliver the, the best intelligence, and they don't want to be leveraged from anyone on either side of the aisle. That, that was the only point. I wasn't, wasn't directed at, at, at you, Senator, uh, at all. Oh, no, I didn't think so. Okay. Um, and how long have you been serving on the House Intelligence Committee? Um, uh, a year and a half. Five months, I guess. Okay, you were appointed to that committee in 2019, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the uh, in its in our fourth report on Russian interference into the 2016 election, this committee has once again reaffirmed the unanimous consensus of 17 intelligence agencies that Russia interfered with the aim of benefiting then candidate Trump's political campaign. However, you and other allies of the president have sought to cast doubt on the consensus conclusions, raising concerns for many of us about your ability to be unbiased, um, which is a necessity to head the DNI. Will you accept the intelligence provided to you by the men and women of the intelligence community, no matter your personal beliefs? And do you accept the findings of the intelligence committee, committee community as it relates to Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. So to your first question, I will accept. Um, to the second question about the specific um, Russia 2017. 2016. I'm sorry, yeah, 2016. Um, uh, or earlier in the, uh, I made the point that um, I respect both committees. I think there's uh, a difference of opinion between the House Intelligence Committee and this committee in terms of one specific finding. I wasn't on the, as you point out, I was not on the House Intelligence Committee at the time of that. I respect both committees, um, but I haven't seen the underlying intelligence with respect to that one finding. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Yes. Uh, you touched on a point with Senator Cotton that I'd like to follow up that I think is critically important, and the, the term I use is conclusion shopping. It's in the nature of any executive to want to be told that the intelligence supports whatever policy direction they want to go in. And it, this is a constant struggle that goes back. I don't care whether the President John F. Kennedy in Vietnam or Lyndon Johnson in Vietnam or George W. Bush at Weapons, weapons of Mass Destruction. Uh, this, is a, this is a human nature problem. Uh, the king said, who will want to rid me of this meddlesome priest in a couple of Knights went and killed Beckett. Uh, the president doesn't have to give an order. That's my concern, and, and that's where it worries me that the president apparently has been pressing the intelligence community to find what he wants them to find. The question should be, where did the virus come from? Not, don't you think it came from a lab? Do you see the distinction I'm trying to make and why this is so crucial? And it's crucial to the president, him or herself, because if they take the intelligence before it gets to them, they're going to make bad decisions. And we're protecting the president themselves by, by guarding against this human nature problem. Every executive wants to hear what they want to hear. Every person that works for that executive wants to tell the boss what they want to hear. Talk to me about this concern. I think this is a critical issue, particularly with a president who is so strong-willed and has indicated in the past a strong desire to press the intelligence community to tell him what he wants to do. Well, Senator, I appreciate the question, and I appreciate the fact that we had a chance to visit about this um, uh, on the phone, and I, you made it clear that this is one aspect of, of politicization of the intelligence community. Um, uh, sometimes it happens uh, even unintentionally. Um, and, um, and I share the, the sentiment or the concern generally. Um, uh, and I, I've tried to make it clear in our conversations or our conversation uh, about that that I agree with the sentiment and how I intend to approach this. I, I can't comment on things that haven't happened yet. I'm trying to make clear my approach to how I will deal um, with the issue, and I, I think I've been I've been very clear that um, what anyone wants the intelligence to say um, won't impact the intelligence they get from me that I deliver. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, I would suggest, and I'll close with this, that if you give information to the president that isn't accurate, that isn't unvarnished, that is an act of disloyalty to the president, let alone to the Constitution. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Congressman. I appreciate, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator King. Um, before we transition to our last block today, I want to remind members we'll get together at 2 o'clock for a closed session in the CDC Senate Intel Committee. Um, I want to turn to myself for one additional question from the Congressman, and then I'll turn to the Vice Chairman for one additional question before we turn to our last block. Congressman, your experience on the House Intelligence Committee has illustrated the importance of a comprehensive oversight. Part of that oversight is being able to dig into the finished intelligence products. For those of us that have been on the Intel Committee um, prior to 9-11, we understood what processing raw intelligence was really like because we didn't have finished product. Um, do you commit to the committee that in the rare instances that the committee asked for raw intelligence to better understand the analytical conclusions that have been come to, that have been uh, determined, that you will provide that raw intelligence for the committee? I will, uh, as, as appropriate. And, and caveating just from the standpoint of um, within my authority and with due regard for um, the sources and methods at that time. Absolutely. Um, lastly, technology, uh, technological innovation is increasingly happening overseas. Uh, the Vice Chairman and I have been incredibly active on the issue of 5G, not because of the jurisdiction of the committee, but because the Intelligence Committee, both in the House and the Senate, is unique in the fact that we see trends before the policy committees do. And we also see the tech side of it, the technology side of it, in a way that uh, would take other committees of jurisdiction months, if not years, to get the same understanding without the degree of clarity that the intelligence community has. What's your view on how the intelligence community should engage with the private sector on technological innovation? Um, well, I think uh, it's a great question that ties into to what you said, the issue of 5G and, and where that where that race stands right now and the, um, where you know, rising powers like China um, are with, with regard to the development of um, uh, 5G you know, global networks and uh, our ability to ensure that uh, interconnected global networks are safe uh, really will demand consistent with the 5G strategy and Senator Cornyn's bill is now a law with regard to that. Um, that we um, that we work harder to work with the private sector and take advantage of um, the technology expertise that we need there to, to make sure that we're first in all of these places. We talk about emerging technologies, uh, Chairman. Um, you know, we have the best intelligence enterprise in the world. Um, to to continue for that to be the case, we've got to continue to innovate and we've got to be first. We've got to be first and best on cyber issues, on AI, on uh, ultimately on quantum. But, but 5, 5G is where we are with regard to that issue now, and it's a pathway um, to being first in those areas. And so, uh, again, it's uh, something that's vitally important, and um, that's my perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I hope you're leaving the discussion getting two quick questions. And one, first is, um, I think a couple of my colleagues have raised some of the questions about uh, the president's comments uh, about his notion that there is somehow a deep state uh, in the intelligence community or within law enforcement um, that is somehow um, going against his wishes. Have you ever made any statements about a deep state within the intelligence community and or statements that not that I'm aware of, Senator. The reason I'm hesitating is um, sometimes you're asked questions by reporters about using terms. And stuff. It's not a term that I. But have you have you made any statements saying that you, you believe or oh. implying that the intelligence community is no. somehow acting inappropriately no. to target the president? No. 
And do you have any view on how the intelligence community professionals, um, what kind of effect that would have on the, on the morale of um, uh, folks who are hearing these kind of accusations? Um, the effect on the morale? And the effect, the effect if, if, if the, the commander in chief is making comments saying somehow impugning the integrity of the intelligence community professionals, that they're somehow part of some secret cabal acting against him, uh, would you agree that has some negative effect upon the, the community's the kind of esprit de corps and morale? Um, my, my impression, Senator, from uh, going to speak to the conversations that, that I've had without um, getting into specifics, I think the sentiment that I've heard from um, uh, the president is it's, it's not intelligence community writ large, it's specific um, individuals and you know, point, pointing to, you know, um, you know, for instance, misuse of intelligence authority um, by certain individuals. And, and um, but uh, again, my focus is I, I want to look forward, not back. I think that's one of the reasons I want this opportunity. All of this underscores the point that the relationship isn't what it should be across the board between the intelligence community, the president, um, and, and, and Congress and its oversight committees. And um, again, it, it may be difficult, but I'd like the opportunity to strengthen that relationship um, for the reasons I've talked about earlier. The, the, the chairman's given me my discretion, so I won't ask. I'm going to come back later and ask you a question about NATO. But I would simply point out that um, it is somewhat unique uh, to me that that not only has the president made these comments about kind of the long-term professionals, but literally every person, I think without exception, that this president has appointed for Senate confirmation within the Director of National Intelligence has been fired or removed or pushed out. My conclusion, maybe not shared by all my colleagues, but because all of those individuals were named took on these positions, did what I thought was right, which is being willing to speak truth to power, and that cost him the job. Um, if you get this job, I hope you'll continue in, in the vein of the, of the, the Dan Coates and the Sue Gordons and uh, the Joe McGuire's and the Andrew Holland's, uh, who I think um, honored their commitment, to, uh, even at the cost of their job. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In an effort to get back on time, let me explain this one question. I know some of you came in and you felt, why do I have to sit down there? For you to sit up here, we have to wipe down every seat of the person who's already in, so to accommodate the time blocks. Not, not exclusively you, Senator Bennett, but uh, this afternoon when we meet at 2 o'clock for the closed session, <clears throat> we will be wiping down the seats because we don't have as many. Um, we don't have some accommodations in the Senate Intelligence Committee. With that, I recognize Senator Corn. Congressman Bradford, this uh, morning when I said a few words of introduction, I alluded to the uh, unique nature of the job to which you've been nominated. And I think um, what I'd like to hear from you, um, and forgive me if you've already talked about this extensively. Um, but how do you view the transition from the adversarial process of uh, either as a prosecutor or as a member of Congress battling over public policy issues or maybe conducting business oversight in the role of the federal government? How do you make that transition to become this uh, head of the intelligence community and be willing and able to provide unvarnished uh, intelligence to policy. I, um, I would say I view it as a welcome transition, uh, hopefully. Uh, again, I uh, love serving uh, the people of my district and serving in Congress. Um, but again, respectfully, uh, when I was at the Department of Justice, there's something about um, representing the United States, standing up to represent the United States, um, where you have the ability to um, uh, say, you know, 
politics will play no part. Uh, I don't. I won't let uh, party allegiance play any factor in, in the work that I do. Um, it's very analogous to this position, and it's one that um, uh, I, I very much look forward to. The mission is too important. Um, I look at the threats that we're facing around the world and, and what's happening and what we're living in right now with this, with this pandemic, and, and um, uh, you know we will only continue to, to be the world superpower if we have the best intelligence enterprise, and it has to be one that's apolitical. Um, it has to be one that's the unvarnished truth, as Senator King uh, has said repeatedly, um, without shading. Um, and without consideration for what anyone wants that intelligence to say. And I've been in that role, and that's what I would I, I offer in terms of, of reassurance, in, in terms of um, my time at the Justice Department and leading, again, a federated enterprise, um, you know, not, not the, to the scope uh, uh, and size of the intelligence community, but the U.S. Attorney's Office um, is significant. To put it in perspective, there's 435 congressional districts uh, the country is divided up into. 100 United States Senators, there's only 93 federal districts. Um, and in my case, it was 35,000 square miles, um, more than 3 million um, uh, residents within that. And so operating and coordinating and integrating in pursuit of national security priorities like the prevention of terrorism, um, I think is good training for this. Um, but it's, uh, it's something that I found, um, again, that I enjoyed doing and, and I look forward to it too. On a larger scale, at a time that I think our country really needs it, and again, I think that I'm uh, well qualified to do. Congressman Brad Kurtz, my uh, my friend, the ranking member, uh, Senator Warner, um, frames this as speaking truth to power. But let me frame it a little differently. Do you have any problem in telling the president the truth about what our intelligence community has produced? allow him to then make the best decisions in consultation with his team? Respectfully, Senator, I don't have a problem telling anyone, the President, members of uh, this committee, um, uh, anyone that would be a consumer of intelligence and is entitled to, um, uh, to see it, whether as an overseer or whatever respect. The intelligence has to speak um, to exactly what the uh, men and women um, who are doing the collection and analysis of it, we're all better served with the best unvarnished um, intelligence, and, and that is truth to power, and I look forward to doing that to, to anyone. And what's the danger if you somehow shaded or or nuanced the, uh, the, the information for the policymakers, including the President of the United States? Everything that, that we, that the, the intelligence community uh, does, is designed to inform all policy um, makers, the president, the National Security Council, um, uh, our military leaders, and members of Congress, to have the best information to make our national security decisions. So to give anything other than the best information is to jeopardize our national security. It's something I just won't do. In closing, uh, I was glad to see our mutual friend, Congressman Will Hurd, writing an op-ed piece uh, supporting your nomination. Will, as we both know, served in the CIA before he came to Congress. He's uh, steeped in these issues like uh, very few are, and uh, I was glad to see that vote of confidence. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Gordon uh, this morning with a really great letter from Attorney General Ashcroft. I'm very pleased uh, with how he commended you. In the letter, uh, he said, this is Senator Ashcroft, or, or Attorney General Ashcroft, that integrity is the indispensable imperative for intelligence, the best friend in national security. And national security is the singular portfolio of most emergency in infection and evaluation that results from inaccuracy and distortion. For high quality decision making, sound intelligence must never be contaminated by personal bias or political predisposition. Do you agree with that statement? Why, to follow up on, on Senator Horning's question, why is it so important that sound intelligence 
above all else, really, must never be contaminated by personal bias or political predisposition. Simply because it would jeopardize national security decisions. Can you elaborate? Well, um, again, the, the, what, what the intelligence community does, uh, the, you know, the, the best men and women in the world doing the best collection, the best analysis, um, it has to be delivered um, um, accurately so that um, you as a, as a legislator, the president, um, as the commander in chief, our, our, our military leaders advising him, have the best information. And if it's shaded or colored or changed or impacted at all, that means you don't have the best information, which means you're not making the best decision. I agree with that. And so do you think that in a situation where you have leadership in this government that seems uh, biased or predisposed to an outcome that's not supported by the intelligence, and that there's risk to jobs of people in the intelligence community who could report that accurately, like, let's say, in North Korea, somebody delivers that intelligence to the man the great leader wouldn't want to hear, and bad things happen to a person there. Can you see uh, how that would distort, potentially, the work of the intelligence committee? Yes. And will you protect the intelligence committee at all costs? Yes. Including at, at the cost of your own job? Yes. I appreciate that, because I think your job, if you're confirmed, is to enable the intelligence committee specialists to do their job which all of us need to, not just because we're on this committee, but because we're American citizens, patriots, and we love this country. I agree. And they need to be able to do it without fear of political or bribery. And we face a situation now, you're inheriting an agency where the president fired the, the IC Inspector General, Mike, Michael Atkinson, because he didn't like the way the IG did his job. How, how are we going to undo that? How, how, what, how specifically are you going to deal with the impact of the Inspector General being fired because the President disagreed with the way he did his job? He did his job according to the law. So what, how, do, you, do you think there's collateral damage as a result of an action taken like that? Well, I, I don't know until I'm um, confirmed um, what the reaction is, um, you know, within the community. What would you suspect it would be? Well, I, I, I honestly don't know what the, uh, to, to your point about um, the Inspector General. Uh, again, I want to relitigate uh, uh, issues, but I don't think this is relitigating issues. This is, this is what the President of the United States is projecting to the men and women of our intelligence. <coughs> the nominating you. Congressman, the president said the intelligence agencies have run amok. That was in the context of nominating you. That's this hearing. Do you think the intelligence agencies of the United States have run amok? No. Do you think that there's an effect on morale among the, the men and women of our intelligence agencies when the president of the United States says they've run amok? Again, I, I think I've tried to address this um, earlier. I heard the answers earlier, by the way. Okay. So, but I'm asking it again because I don't think you addressed it. Do you, do you think there's an effect on morale when the President of the United States describes the intelligence community as having run amok, and that's why he's nominated you? I hope not. I hope you hope there isn't an effect. Do you think right. the intelligence agencies of the United States are running amok? No. Do you think it is would be your responsibility if you're confirmed for this position when you disagree with the president on something so important as whether our intelligence agencies have run them up that you will say so on the public record? As I have said, um, I think many times, Senator, um, it doesn't matter what the what the president says or what any. Um, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell. I don't. Know, I heard you say that before. I think there is no equivalent between the chief law enforcement officer of this country, uh, the, the commander in chief saying what he says, and with all respect to the people around this table, what a politician in Congress might say. Although I will say, I think there are constructive ways of serving in Congress and unconstructive ways. And this idea that we're accepting that people are just going to be bitter partisans in their Congress, I actually don't accept that. I think it reflects poorly on us. 
when we do. But I, but I still would like to have an answer to the question. If you disagree, if the president said tomorrow that the intelligence agencies in this country have run amok, would you publicly disagree with what the president said? Nothing the president says will impact the delivery of the intelligence. That's not the question that I have. Would I? If you, if the president says to this afternoon that the intelligence agencies in this country are running amok, will you publicly disagree with the president? I will. Um, Give the president my best intelligence, um, unvarnished. I, I, I don't know if I'm not, we're not, uh, I'm not understanding how I'm not answering. I think that that would meet the Ashcroft test. I think that if you couldn't do it without, without, if you couldn't bring yourself to say that the men and women of the intelligence agency communities are not running oh. amok. I don't think you I, 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 I'm trying, just to be clear, Senator, I don't think that the men and women of the intelligence community are running amok. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. And you know, so you said earlier in your question that he did not believe they were running amok. I think you did have a disconnection. I'm sorry if I misunderstood. What the thought was, Senator Sass. Thank you. Thank you, cousin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Congressman, congratulations on your nomination. Uh, Senator Cornyn underscored um, the Will Heard op-ed. I think it's very important, and I hope that uh, folks here uh, read that as well. Congressman Heard's obviously widely respected on these issues. Uh, thanks for the time that we've had over the last few weeks. In the classified session, I'm going to ask you some more questions to press you uh, on whether you think the ODNI works right now, whether it's a functioning bureaucratic layer or whether it's an encumbrance, whether the post 9-11 reasons that it were created are actually being advanced. Um, but one of the specific pieces of that that we'll talk about in a classified setting that I want to unpack more fully here is, you, you know it's my view, there's no more pressing national security threat the United States faces uh, than the next decade of the tech race with China. And all 17 of our intelligence agencies, but especially the CIA and the NSA, um, are getting that message, and they're ramping it up. But we've been talking about a pivot to China for 10 or 15 years in this country. And I think the agencies are still slow to devote sufficient mindshare, money, personnel, et cetera, uh, to the China threat. So in this public setting, a rare thing for the intelligence community, uh, where you get to speak directly to the American people, can you explain what the Made in China 2025 initiative is and uh, why China's pursuing it and whether the American people should be concerned? Sure. Um, thanks for the question, Senator. And um, uh, you and I have talked, and, and earlier um, I identified China as the greatest uh, threat that we face, the greatest threat actor that we face moving forward for the exact reasons that you talked about. Um, uh, made in China 2025 is one of only a few, it is one of many initiatives that the Chinese government, um, the Belt and Road uh, 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 Initiative, the um, Military Civil Fusion Initiative, the um, all, all initiatives uh, of the same, uh, or all spokes of the same initiative for uh, China to supplant us as, as as the global power in all respects. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, it's, it's why I think you and I agree that China is the rising threat and why we have to look at the national intelligence uh, policy framework and, uh, and our budgeting and our resource allocation to make sure that we're dedicating towards um, all of these different initiatives where uh, an authoritarian regime wants to set the marketplace rules as they, as they do with, with uh, uh, Made in China 2025. Um, where they want Chinese companies dominating um, industry across 10 different uh, sectors, um, just as they want with the military fusion, Chinese companies gathering and collecting intelligence and sharing it with the Chinese Communist Party. Um, whereas with um, uh, Belt and Road, they want to um, uh, dominate all of the hubs for uh, um, trade routes and telecommunications. All of these things are, are China trying to um, essentially supplant um, free marketplace standards and uh, values like liberty and free speech and all the things that we have with uh, a, a authoritarian um, values that are reflected in some of the things that are happening um, in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, before we get to the way they're using uh, 
coronavirus and, and COVID. Just say for a second that the Chinese Communist Party's use of tech and maybe emphasize AI in particular. How did the communists who lead China, and to be clear, when, when U.S. businesses uh, pretend that there is a public-private sector distinction in China, they're exaggerating. There is not much of a public-private sector distinction in China, but it's understandable, both because U.S. companies want those markets, 1.4 billion people and 400 million are middle class, there are more middle class people in China than in the U.S., about 345 million, only about 250 are middle class. So there's a lot of consumers in China. It makes sense that U.S. producers would be interested in having access to those markets. But also, it's important for us to always underscore that our opponent here is not the Chinese people. Our opponent is the communist leadership of China. But what is the Communist Party uh, trying to do with tech and with AI in particular? So we used to, uh, in an example, because uh, I'll start with, with 5G, because uh, 5G leads to AI, AI leads to quantum. Um, and to your point about where um, the Chinese Communist Party stops and starts, it's hard to tell with a company like Huawei. And, and if, if, if Huawei has an obligation to share information under Chinese law with the Chinese Communist Party, they have created a global network, and our information is going over the line, uh, and our allies that we're sharing information with, that's jeopardizing our information, it's jeopardizing our troops. All of these things um, are basically put at risk with respect to that. And so, um, uh, you know, again, this is just uh, uh, why you are so correct. Um, Senator, in terms of uh, making sure that we are balanced in terms of where we are investing in terms of the global threat landscape, pandemic, uh, um, you know, 5G, AI, all, all, I don't want to say all those coming to China, but a lot of them do. What are the technical fields that you're most concerned about them being at or equal to us uh, in terms of uh, their long-term plotting against us a generation, I think Eric Schmidt, the former executive chairman of Google, regularly talks about a tech generation as being 18-ish months. Um, what tech fields are you most, uh, technical fields are you most concerned about their near parity arrival with us? Yeah, so, I mean, just in terms of the, um, you know, the point, uh, cybersecurity generally um, tying in, I've mentioned 5G, um, but one of the things that I'm most concerned about is um, uh, investment towards quantum computing. We have in the, with the, with the NSA, um, we have the best code makers and breakers in the world. Um, uh, General Nakasone, I think you and I agree, is a national treasure. Um, but if, the, if China um, gets the quantum first, um, uh, we're in trouble. And so um, that, for me, is, is, is one of the when we look at investments and looking forward and the, and the challenges that we face and the fact that China's investing more towards those technologies um, than the United States presently, we need to rebalance. Uh, I'm going to give it back to the chairman here, but I just want to underscore the point you just made. I'm a small government guy, uh, but we are radically underinvesting in a lot of the fields that you just mentioned. Quad Paul Nakasone is an absolute national treasure, but the team he leads at the NSA, lots of their work is made obsolete if the, if the quantum race, if race is won by China, and we're under investing in that space. Thanks. I look forward to the class five time this afternoon. Senator Reese. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Congressman. Um, in your view, have we made progress in reversing North Korea's nuclear cooperation and nuclear development? Um, I view North Korea as um, the same uh, danger that, uh, that, they, that they have been. I understand uh, and I appreciate the diplomatic negotiations um, that are taking place, and I hope that, um, uh, you know, that, that there might be some concessions about um, their nu nuclear uh, weapons in exchange for sanctions relief, um, but I, uh, I can't address whether or not we've made progress with respect to that or not. You know, um, uh, given the class uh, information that I've been privy to at this point, um, perhaps it, uh, you know, if, if confirmed as DNI and I had a chance to visit with um, Secretary Pompeo, um, and I, I think there's a diplomatic piece here that I don't know the, that I can't speak to, that I don't know the answer to. Uh, changing subject now for Iran, were they in compliance with the ACQA when the President withdrew? Um, 
I'm not sure. I, I might have to. I, I don't know technically if they were um, out of compliance at, at the time. Well, since this time, do you think their activities become more maligned? I think Iran is becoming increasingly desperate as a, as a result of the maximum pressure campaign, and I think that that's reflected in, in the fact that, that we see more provoking um, uh, activity from them. Um, and not just, uh, you know, when you talk about Iran, you have to really look across. Um, you're talking about Yemen, you're talking about Syria, you're talking about their proxies around. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a regional uh, issue, and they're getting more aggressive everywhere because I think that they are increasingly um, more desperate. They, the internal strife that is going on um, in, in that regime, one of the common ways to deal with the, the internal conflict that's happening is to, um, to try and um, coalesce around an outside uh, adversary, and, and uh, U.S. and our interests um, in that region uh, provide that. That's how they're trying to maintain control. I, I will say this, Senator, I think that the um, this is one of the things when I talk about the impact of a, a COVID-19 pandemic where in places uh, all around the world, but in the Middle East, where you don't already have social unrest um, and, and a chance for upheaval, those conditions can be sharper um, where you have uh, what we believe is, you know, um, underreporting in Iran with respect to the impact of, of COVID-19. But from your comments, the, the national pressure campaign has made them more hostile, more aggressive, and more disruptive. Uh, I think they're um, uh, more desperate is how I would characterize it. Um, and, uh, you know, what they're trying to do, in, in, from my perspective, is to, you know, leverage the international community to, to provoke something that um, uh, draws it into something that might provide relief from the sanctions that they're under. Let me uh, change subject to something that's been uh, discussed several times here. That's election security. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you would concede that in 2016, the Russians were involved. Yes. 2018, the Russians were yes. involved. In 2020, this election, they are involved. Yes. The, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee and Bipartisan Page for the Safety concluded in 2016 they were in favor of supporting President Trump and in this favor that they wouldn't take these steps to promote one and to uh, deter the other. Um, yet in your written response to the intelligence uh, you did not publicly commit to notifying the American public when you had critical information of Russian involvement. And I think it's a fundamental aspect of democracy. People should know when they go into the voting booth who's doing what, what candidates are being supported by who. And that's um, something that goes back to the beginning of democracy. Uh, and yet, you would not commit to that public demonstration. You would say, uh, you instead mention the need to safeguard the confidentiality interests of the executive branch, which is basically cover the president's position. Is, is, is that your position? I, I, I'm not sure the question I, I've answered. I think uh, 150 different questions. I, I, I want to be real clear about Russia and other countries, but Russia in particular, I agree with uh, at the way you read uh, the interview 2016, 2018, 2020. They're going to continue to do it. I'm, I'm for safe, secure, credible elections, and um, uh, we do everything I can in BNI to ensure that they uh, are not successful. So I, I don't know the question and the answer in specific that you're referring to, but, okay. if, but if I need to elaborate or clarify. Well, I think you should review your written responses because uh, if the quote is safe, does the confidentiality interest of the executive branch will be considered, which sounds a lot like I, the president comes first and then if it doesn't really bother him, then I'll let it go. Well, that, that, that was certainly not my intent, and I, I'll reiterate that, that, that again, that I, I think I've made clear throughout. Um, the so will public commit to disclosing to the American people if the intelligence being conferred with high confidence that the Russians are involved and the Russians are involved in promoting the third candidate. That is the exact 
that is the uh, conclusion that the intelligence community on confirmed as DNI. Is that your question? Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. I thank the members. Um, this brings to a close public session. Um, Congressman, let me say to you, this, is, this point is not to solicit an answer, it's to create a thought process as we venture down this road of pandemic. Uh, I can one believe that the private sector will look very different when we come out on the other end as companies assess productivity from work at home, uh, the need for um, high-rise office buildings crammed full of people, uh, the way we interact, I think, will change. And the private sector is very capable of making those assessments and accomplishing that type of change. I would suggest to you that uh, when you're confirmed, now is a great opportunity to begin to think about not just reorganization of the DNI shop, but reorganization of the intelligence community reflecting what Senator Sass said about te technology. Um, it's not just about funding technology to be competitive. It's creating a model that actually generates the type of breakthroughs that we know we need for um, 5G, AI. Uh, our, these members have heard the vice chairman and I talk many times if this were 20 years ago and we were faced with a 5G issue getting started late, uh, we would uh, be with our five eyes partners throwing everything on the research bench, the best and the brightest working together, and we would create something far superior to what Huawei had, and and that's how we would win the 5G war. Uh, it's not too late, but we've got to begin to think like that throughout the whole, um, the whole of the IC. Just because we've done it one way for 50 years doesn't mean that the future necessarily, necessarily means that we've got to do it that way. And I think um, we've got an IC that has changed greatly, but it's leadership that enables change to happen expeditiously. So I, I hope you'll consider that. Um, I, I want to thank you, John, for your time this morning. I want to thank the members for working under this temporary construct to continue to to conduct the committee's important business. I look forward to advancing your nomination rapidly and to voting in favor of your confirmation in the full Senate. Again, if any members wish to submit questions for the record after today's hearing, please do, do so quickly because it's my intention to bring Congressman Radcliffe up to a vote inside the committee. And at this point, we'll recess and reconvene this afternoon in closed session in the Senate Intel uh, room in um, the Capitol, SBC 217. This hearing is adjourned.